What types of stock and bond returns should we expect for our retirement portfolios? This is a question that's come across my desk a few times over the past several weeks. The question about how should I build assumptions into my retirement plan? What should I expect from my investment portfolio as I'm entering and living through retirement? And this is a very, very important question. Setting good assumptions around what we think our portfolio is capable of producing over that time frame can mean the difference between estimating too conservatively and then potentially chasing investments that may not be suitable for our plan or estimating too aggressively and then running the risk of spending too much money early in retirement and then potentially running out of money later in retirement. In this video, I'm going to walk through the historical returns of diversified portfolios of equities, fixed income and treasury bills. I'm going to talk about inflation over that time period, and then I'm going to shift the conversation to future expected returns for stocks and bonds and inflation uh, around assumptions that I think are suitable for retirees' financial plans. And then I'm going to finish the video talking about some different types of investments that sometimes do come across my desk and people ask me about that may carry higher levels of risk than retirees and investors may believe. But before we get started, my name is Mark Walhout. I run an investment advisory and financial planning business called Walhout Financial. I help people with retirement and I created this channel to share ideas and concepts that I'm using to help people with retirement every single day. If you want to get more videos like these, consider subscribing to the channel and hit the bell icon so that you're notified when new videos are posted. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. Leave me any questions or comments below. I'm very quick to answer questions and respond to comments. And the comments that you share and the conversations we have here inspire ideas for future videos. So this video was actually inspired by a question that I received from a viewer in a private message that said, what kind of investment portfolio could I construct that would generate for me 10% per year throughout my retirement? And it made me wonder and made me think now might be a really good time to sort of set those expectations around what I think is reasonable to assume for retirement portfolio. So I'm going to take you through uh, some historical returns for diversified portfolios. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to share my screen and we're going to start there. So what you're looking at is a chart going back to 1993 and it shows the historical performance of uh, a, a number of different asset classes. So the first one, the one that's kind of stands out, the highest returning asset class over that time period is a portfolio of global stocks or global equities. As we kind of go down the chart here, the next category or asset class is fixed income, diversified fixed income, Canadian fixed income, so government bonds as well as corporate bonds. The light blue line here is 30-day treasury bills, so short-term government bonds, as risk-free as it gets, very, very low volatility. And then the final line here is inflation or the consumer price index in Canada over that time horizon. So I love teaching with photographs or love teaching with pictures because what it does is it helps you visualize those trade-offs. The ones that we always come back to with investing is risk and return are tied at the hip. We cannot separate them as much as we may want to. If you want to achieve higher returns, you need to be able to accept and live through periods of higher volatility. So equities over that long time frame of 30 years have been the best performing asset class. But you'll notice as well that they've been the most volatile. They move around the most, they're mo they, they go up and down the most. And then as we kind of go down the list, you'll see the volatility starts to lower, but the returns sort of in, in lockstep lower from there. And so to kind of carry on from uh, the photograph, what we've got here or the image on the screen is sort of some of the numbers. So um, from January 1993 through May of this year, which is just over 30 years, Equities over that time horizon have returned 8.30% per year. And for each of these categories or asset classes, I've included the best five years in that time period and the worst five years. Just to give you an idea of the range of outcomes, a lot of times when we do like investment um, fit exercises, we talk about one year returns. But for retirees, I think five years, even longer actually, are really good time clips to understand sort of the range of different outcomes that you can experience with these different asset classes. But the best five years over the past 30 years for equities uh, was a return of 20% per year, which is amazing. Uh, but the worst five-year returns on an annualized basis for equities was negative 5.69%. So that means that you realize negative average returns over a five-year period. So kind of going back to our earlier comment, equities have provided historically the highest amount of return, but in the short or medium term are the most volatile. Next, we have fixed income, 5.54% per year over the past 30 years. The best five years was 11.27% per year. The worst uh, five-year period was 0.13% per year. Continuing down the list, treasury bills, short-term government debt, 2.51% per year over the last 30 years. The best five, per, five years was 4.85% per year. The worst five, 0.7% per year. And then finally, inflation 
over the last 30 years up until this year has averaged around 2.04% per year. The best five years was low inflation, 1.18% per year. The worst five, 3.28% per year. So that's a lot of numbers that I just threw at you, but really I'm trying to sort of set the stage. Historical returns for each of those major asset classes that make up most diversified portfolios. And now it kind of brings up the question, how do we now want to think about how to construct portfolios for retirement for the future? What are we trying to accomplish? And I think for retirees portfolios, we're trying to do a couple things. Number one, we're trying to create a portfolio that's going to grow such that the withdrawals in the later part of retirement are funded and can keep up with the cost of living, keep up with inflation. So we want to have growth in the portfolio. But at the same time, we need to reduce volatility in the portfolio such that we don't go through a period of really high volatility early in retirement and deplete the portfolio prematurely. And then secondly, of course, we want to remain inside of the retirees or the individual's ability, willingness and need to take risk. If you're holding a portfolio that's predominantly in equities, which can be sensible in certain circumstances because you want to achieve those higher expected returns, you need to be able to live through periods of very, very high volatility. And we don't need to look too far back in history to see periods where we've had really high volatility. In the COVID uh, spring of 2020, a global portfolio of equities would have dropped by nearly a third. So somebody who's retired, just beginning to draw income from their portfolio, would have seen their portfolio drop by a third. That can be terrifying for somebody that's just entering retirement. We need to factor that into our planning as we build out these portfolios. So uh, I like to always, again, come back to images when I teach. And this is sort of the image that I like to draw out for retirees when we're building uh, portfolios for retirement income. The image on the left is sort of the portfolio as you're constructing it in your working life. What you're noticing here is your bucket's filling with water. Water for now is going to be like our proxy for our retirement dollars. And you'll notice that there, there is some volatility in the portfolio. Let's assume for a moment that this portfolio is predominantly in equities. The person or the individual, while they're building their portfolio for retirement, they know that there's ups and downs with the market, but they can be somewhat relaxed about it because they know they're still working. They're not relying on that portfolio for income. In fact, they're still adding more money to the top of that portfolio, adding more money to their bucket. And so they're somewhat at peace with the idea that, you know what, the market will come back. I'm not you know, needing this money right now for my retirement income. I'm okay to live through that period. Now, a couple things happen when you retire. Uh, the first thing is that you put a lid on the top of your bucket. So there's no more money going into the top of that bucket in most cases. And then the second thing that you do is you add a faucet on the bottom of your bucket and you start taking a distribution or taking money or withdrawals out of that portfolio on either a steady or somewhat steady basis. Now, people will take more from their portfolios at different times in their retirement, but for the purpose of the analogy, I think that this holds that you're putting a lid on top of your bucket and you're also adding a faucet and you're starting to take money out. All of a sudden, the level of volatility that you're experiencing inside of that bucket matters a lot. If you go through a period of a lot of volatility, specifically downward volatility in that first part of retirement, you run into a scenario where you risk depleting the portfolio too quickly. Meaning that if the value of the portfolio drops and you're taking a steady stream of income from the portfolio, there's not enough water left in that portfolio to experience the next rise. And you sort of have this sort of slow downward drawdown effect, which creates a situation where the retiree may end up running out of money before they run out of life. And that's the scenario we want to avoid. So in retirement research, uh, a lot of good retirement research, you know, there's no rules of thumb in retirement. And I hope that you've gathered that from um, watching these videos that I don't believe in rules of thumb, but a popular uh, allocation to equities and fixed income for retiree portfolios can be something in the neighborhood of a balanced portfolio that has about half in equities, diversified global equities, and half in diversified fixed income. So if we're purely looking at historical returns for a portfolio like that, over the past 30 years, that portfolio has returned about 6.92% per year, and that's ignoring fees, um, but at the top line, 6.92% per year. So now the question is, should we use that portfolio as sort of our proxy or that return level as a proxy for what we can expect in the future? And unfortunately, the answer is no. Um, the, the historical returns of stocks and bonds can be a good inform, like it, it can inform how we build assumptions around what we think returns are going to be in the future. But the best predictor of future returns is a couple things with, uh, with equities, it's current prices relative to the underlying fundamentals of the stocks that make up that basket of equities. What I mean by underlying fundamentals is things like earnings, cash flow, profitability. So 
if the prices relative to the value of the underlying businesses is high relative to history, then the next set of returns we can expect to be lower. With fixed income, the best proxy for future fixed income returns is current interest rates or current yields. So the higher that current yields are, the higher that future expected returns from fixed income are. So when we're building assumptions around the next set of returns that we can expect in the future over you know, the next se several years or several decades, if we're talking about a retirement, we need to know or, or at least uh, respect the fact that current prices, current valuations and current yields may be lower today than they were at the beginning of the period that we just mentioned. It's possible that the next set of returns may be lower than the set of returns we've, we've just uh, experienced. So now I'm gonna talk about or share uh, a guideline for you. So this is a chart that comes from the FP Canada Projection Assumption Guideline. So FP Canada is an organization that sets sort of standards around how um, we build financial plans as financial planners. And they create this publication every year where they, they lay out a set of, set of recommendations around what we should be using as sort of a benchmark to build assumptions around future um, uh, returns and a number of other factors, borrowing rate, um, uh, as well as inflation, uh, in order to build you know, solid financial plans. And this is just what they released um, this spring, or it was just released in, uh, in April this year. But I'm gonna highlight a few things. So the inflation rate they've assumed going forward, long-term inflation to be around 2.1%. Fixed income returns at around 3.2%. Canadian equity expected returns around 6.2%. Uh, foreign developed markets, so U.S. and, and uh, developed international market returns around 6.5% and emerging market returns around 7.4%. So if we distill that down into a portfolio of 50% uh, global fixed income and then split the rest out uh, of about one third in the equity sleeve of Canadian equities, one third in U.S. and one third in international and emerging markets, when we combine all these different values together in that portfolio, that shows us a projected return assumption for this portfolio of 4.85% per year going forward. And that's before factoring in investment fees. Now, 4.85 is certainly less than 6.92. So the future expected returns based on the assumptions that were built into this report from FB Canada is that we should expect lower returns in the future for a similar portfolio based on you know, the current market uh, the current market situation, current market um, uh, fundamentals as it relates to fixed income and equities. Now, at this point, what I'll do is I'll highlight that this is not a forecast. This is a projection. This is a set of guidelines. And I think that as it relates to building assumptions around financial planning, you know, using a little bit more conservative uh, estimates and guidelines is probably a prudent thing, you know, to, within, within reason, of course, we don't want to be too prudent because sometimes if we sort of, if we're super uber conservative, it can push people to think, you know what, if I can only get really, you know, kind of mediocre returns in these traditional asset classes, these diversified, you know, more, we'll call it like reliable asset classes, it might force me into investments that may be riskier. And I do see this happen quite a bit. I'm going to talk about that in a couple minutes. Um, but being a little bit more conservative, a bit more, um, we'll say like, you know, conservative and reserved about what we expect for future returns, I don't think is a bad thing. Um, the second thing that I'll comment on future return expectations from the FP Canada report is that these things change all the time. We've seen, if, and I'll kind of go back to my first chart here, that you know even though the historical returns of these asset classes, oh, I'm going to add myself back in here, the historical returns of these asset classes have been, um, you know, averaging at around 8.3% for equities and and uh, for bonds 5.54% over the past 30 years those asset classes went through periods that way overshot and way undershot that average. So in the short term, returns can be quite volatile and they can move around quite a bit, which kind of brings me to my final point on uh, these assumptions is that they need to be revisited constantly, right? At least once a year, I think, for retirees to review current status of the plan, current portfolio values, new assumptions as it relates to, or refreshed assumptions as it relates to um, portfolio returns. And just to make sure we kind of monitor that plan. And if the plan is asking us or telling us to make adjustments to our pattern, to our spending, to our behavior, good or bad, we should be responding to those signals um, as often as we possibly can. And so the last thing that I'll close on is, you know, sometimes we'll talk about portfolios or I'll talk about portfolio construction with retirees. And I'll talk about these traditional asset classes, which I believe to me are the most prudent way to invest for 
a retirement that's going to last 30 years. It's a diversified set of global equities, global fixed income for the investment component of the portfolio. Of course, there's going to be other sources of inf- income from Canada Pension Plan, old age security, perhaps annuities. Um, so, so you know, the portfolio is not everything in the plan, but as far as the portfolio is concerned, I'm a big fan of broadly diversified global portfolios that are low cost, that are systematic in their nature and construction, the way that they're rebalanced, simple, but very effective over long periods of time. But for the retiree that sometimes wants to reach for higher returns, sometimes they'll come to me with questions about other investments that may offer or the promise or the potential of higher returns. And, you know, things that fall into this category sometimes are things like individual dividend paying stocks, private debt, um, mortgage investment corporations. Um, you know, there, there's there's really no shortage of, uh, of things that sort of come up where it's like, hey, I can get this investment that's going to guarantee me a return of, you know, some number higher than the projected uh, returns of a, a globally diversified portfolio of stocks and bonds. And without digging into the merits of each of those individual types of investments, I, I, like, I like to always come back to this simple visual, which highlights the fact that risk and return go hand in hand, okay? And there's really no way that I'm aware of that you can separate these two things. We would say, or it's, I think it's fair to say that a portfolio of you know 50% stocks, 50% bonds would land somewhere on the risk spectrum around here. I'm gonna call this 50-50 globally diversified. low cost. And we know that the assumptions that we outlined based on FP Canada's assumptions here is something like 4.8% per year. Now, someone may come to me and say, you know what, I've been offered this opportunity, and I'm not going to name a specific investment, that's going to give me something like 8% or 9% guaranteed every single year. And so my response to that is, okay, that's fine. The person that's offering you that investment is not doing it because they're trying to be altruistic. They're not doing it to do you a special favor. There is some form of risk there that you're taking on, right? And that can be credit risk, meaning that the person that's offering the investment may not have the ability to pay you back. It may be liquidity risk, meaning that you may not be able to liquidate that investment if you want to. Um, There's a whole host of other risks that, that could be involved in that. So I would say without picking on any one individual type of investment, Just know that this relationship of risk and return, in the time that I've been doing what I'm doing as an advisor, I haven't really identified a good, clean, and effective and reliable way to separate those two things. So anyways, this video has been long enough. I appreciate you watching this long. If you made it to the end, thank you so much. Uh, Hit the like button if you like this video. If you want to get more videos like these sent to to your feed, Um, Subscribe to the the channel and hit the bell icon so that you're notified when new videos are posted. If you have any questions or comments, leave them below and I'll speak with you soon. Take care.